All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Judy Barkas, who is across and up and over a bit in Chicago, Illinois. How are you doing, Judy? Doing fantastic. Thrilled to be here. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we're just com just commiserating with Judy because I'm sure the the snow plows will be coming out in a, in a few <laughs> weeks or a month or two or whatever it is. Oh my gosh, <laughs> way too soon, way too soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what we're gonna do, what we're gonna talk about is workplace detox and uh, and uh, and how you actually detox a workplace and what does even a toxic workplace really look like and how does you, how do you all detox so. Let's just get straight into it. Uh, get straight into it, Julie. Sure. Number one, just give people a little background about why workplace detox is something that you have focused in on. You know, it's really interesting. I've been working with uh, leaders in industries for over 20 years, helping them transform their workplaces. And just recently, the name Workplace Detox popped out to me. It's like, oh, this is what we've been doing all these years is really detoxing workplaces. So we really want to look at what's going on that's destructive in a workplace and think about how do we make it more constructive. And for 20 years, leaders have been calling me saying, Julie, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And to me, it's really about what do we need to stop doing? What do we need to pull back the reins on doing so that we can have a more positive and productive workplace. And my interest in workplaces stems back way back over 20 years ago when I was a, an employee in corporate America. And I had probably 12 different bosses in like eight years. And there were execution style firings. There was right sizing and downsizing and just consistent efforts to try to create a more profitable company through staff management. And a lot of the situations that I want to say survived or lived through were very destructive and they tore people apart, not only professionally, but also personally. So I really believe that with us spending eight, 10 hours or more a day focusing on work, how do we make it more joyous? How do we make it more pleasant? How do we make it more fun yet in the process, incredibly profitable for the, the company owner? Yeah, no, th th thank you. That was a great synopsis. And I think this is this is where I think that the that the conflict or the challenge comes in, because, you know, everything you're saying, I think most people would agree with, like, you know, let's make this a, a better place and all of that. But some people then would worry that, OK, if maybe the pendulum goes too far in the other direction and it's all about being happy and nice and rah rah <laughs> but you're not very effective you know so there's somewhere there's a there's a balance in there and i think sometimes people think that um not being honest with people is good you know sort of rather than delivering when you have to deliver strong messages or 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 you know whatever is that you back away from them because we want everybody to be happy now so how do you strike that balance I believe that it's really important that as a leader, if you're a leader in any industry, that you try to be as transparent and vulnerable with your team as possible. And I remember back to one of the best bosses I ever had. Her name was Michelle. And she wasn't very rah-rah. She wasn't very like, here's a gift. And I hope you'll be motivated today because I'm putting another carrot in front of your face. She was just very transparent, but some of the things that I really felt deep in my heart was that Michelle, regardless of the situations, had my back. Mm -hmm. And that's what people need to feel. They need to feel your positive belief in them, and they need to know that you brought them on board because of their brilliance, and you're going to stand behind that decision as long as they're living up to their end of the deal. So it doesn't have to go from what, and a lot of leaders do do this, so you're, you're absolutely right. And I never really thought about it this way, but we do swing the pendulum to going like, okay, so it's a destructive workplace now. Let's get everybody gifts. Let's give them bonuses. Let's do this. And then it's like there's never enough. And typically, when we swing the pendulum in that direction, it's like whatever we're doing isn't enough. That mm -hmm. you get a gift, they complain about the color or this or that. So everything becomes very symptomatic. And you start seeing in your workplace that nothing you're doing is really creating the transformation that you desire. Yeah. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think part of it, too, is. That uh, I mean, I worked in Silicon Valley during the dot com era. Uh, oh yeah, that, that that was my that was my introduction to America, which is I've, quite funny. I've, you've got some <laughs> stories to share. 
<laughs> and a lot that I can't. Right, right. <laughs> um, and what, uh, but the, but it started that whole trend at that time, you know, it's about, oh, it's all about foosball tables and massage chairs and this and that. And, that. and if you walk into um, even offices today now that go down that route, and it's fine if you want to buy a foosball table, you know, I don't care. But generally speaking, you'll see all of those things idle because yeah. they don't really make a difference at the end of the day, unless it, it addresses what you were talking about earlier about the central culture. So the accoutrements aren't going to help. If that's so true because you could put a ping pong table in there or you know bring your pets to work day whatever it might be and those things might be feel good but do they really contribute to the objective that you want to achieve as a leader so there's other things that you could be doing to really create that so that people are feeling like they're making an impact in the workplace and yet still feeling very positive at the end of the day and i think with a workplace detox one of the most important things to understand is why turnover happens and in my experience, turnover happens because people get overwhelmed and then they mentally check out before they physically check out. And maybe you could mm -hmm. even think back to some of your jobs and all the time you were like, hmm, wonder if there's a better opportunity. And you're already leaving before you physically have left or put in your notice. And that's happening big time in workplaces right now. And always is that people will mentally leave first and then physically they might remain dead in the workplace. Sometimes <laughs> I hear from leaders for like 10 years, you know, they're still here, but they're not productive. Why, why do they hang in there? So, you know, that's really important to remember. So once you achieve a detox, you have people who are excited, who energetically feel good to be around, and you're excited to work with this team of people that you brought together as well. And, and, and just going back to one thing you mentioned earlier, because I think this is a, a really key point that I just want to that I have written down here that I wanted to come back to is when you mentioned vulnerability right to to some people that might sound like well i got to show weakness or i've got to well, so can you just explain what is the difference between a leader showing vulnerability versus weakness because they're not the same to me vulnerability is really almost opposite of ego so a lot of times in the workplace we have the leader who will be like i'm right i'm right i'm right and it becomes a power struggle and it becomes a struggle the employee doing one thing the employer wanting them to do another thing and then not really getting to a place where the goal is being met so what i try to tell leaders often is let your staff be right even if it means that you're going to be wrong and i will often say to my team um, you know, I might be wrong about this. And just so that they could step up and be right. But the interesting thing that happens is the more you say, you know what, I'm going to take responsibility for this one. Here's what I should have done differently as a leader, or I'm going, or I maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody, you know, give, let's give a solution here. But it also models it for your team so that they feel perfectly comfortable saying, hey, you know what, I might be wrong here. Or you know what, I'm going to take full responsibility for the situation. So when you are those things and you model those things, you're going to catch your team being those things as well, which in the long run is really going to contribute to the goals that you want to achieve coming to life. So to me, it's about putting a big red X through the word ego, because it's not really about who's right and who's wrong. It's about the old saying, it's about what works. Yeah, no, I, 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 I could agree more. And, and I think that is, and, and that's why maybe even in some ways, the word vulnerability isn't, you know, maybe we should find another word, because I think sometimes it, it just has connotations that gets people a little worried. Because what you're talking about there is, is back to the transparency, you know, where you're just being, you're just being honest and transparent. And if you're wrong mm -hmm. about something, you say you're wrong about something. I, I, uh, I'm, I hosted, um, uh, one of the former CEOs of American Airlines one time at, at an event, and um, I can't remember his name now, but he was the one who, he came up with the idea of reward programs, of variable pricing for seating. So he did he did a lot to revolutionize the industry. And uh, and one of the questions was asked him, well, did you ever, did, did you do anything that you regret or something that didn't work? And he goes, and he immediately said, yes. He goes, I introduced and came up with the great idea of the lifetime ticket. <laughs> and and you know so you could buy for like three or four thousand dollars you could buy a lifetime ticket like and just fly <laughs> yeah so this was this was way back now his his yeah. great miscalculation was he assumed adults would buy it but what happened was a load of people bought them for their 
kids and toddlers mm -hmm. and everything. So he said, even today, there are people still flying American Airlines on lifetime tickets <laughs> far beyond. So it was a disaster. But yeah. he has but but he has the so we obviously stopped it. But he had the, as you said, the, you know, the courage, you know, and whatever, just to say, yeah, I've got that one wrong. Yep. Yep. You know, and I think it's sometimes hard to do, but I've worked with leaders where they are absolutely 100% not going to say that they were wrong about anything, mm -hmm. not going to say, oh, I should have done something differently. And then they don't get the transformation that they desire. But then mm -hmm. I have the leaders who will say, all right, this is my goal. And you guys, I, I messed up here and I realized that I need to be doing some things differently. So for the next month, here's what I'm going to be doing so that we can be achieving this goal. And they take full responsibility. And that's where I see transformation happen in teams like so fast, faster than you could ever think a culture change was possible. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And how much does, uh, does accountability play into this? Because I always feel like that's, that's a critical piece. Um, because if you ask people about, you know, should there be accountability and people should be held accountable for, for the, you know, their results and what they do. Everybody would say, Oh yes, yes, absolutely. But they always mean holding other people accountable. <laughs> Whereas the first person you need to hold accountable is yourself. Yeah. Accountability is important. And I think just as important as success celebrations. Mm -hmm. So every single step that you're taking or your team is taking that is right and contributing towards the goal, I think needs to be celebrated just as much as you need to say, all right, here's what I could be doing differently. Because what we focus on expands. And it's true whether it's our waistline <laughs> or our team, it's going to expand if we start focusing on it. Like, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, but if we focus on, hey, Susan, I hired you and I hired you for your brilliance because of this, this, and this, and this, and here's what I'm seeing in the workplace. I'm seeing you really bring it in this, this, and this, and this area. And we celebrate that. And then we say, now let's focus on what you could do a little bit more of or differently to be even more successful in your role. Now, this doesn't mean that if somebody is unsuccessful in their role or coming into work and just putting their head down sleeping, that we're not dealing with those kind of really destructive behaviors. We are, but in a very structured format that is consistent among all team members so that everybody has equal opportunity for growth. Yeah, and, and, it's, in, and it's interesting, um, one of the points that you, you know, raised there just about the, the, you know, the culture, the culture itself and the collective culture is catching people doing things right. And we're all terrible at this, right? We're all terrible. I mean, yes. you know, we can all improve about that because oh my goodness, we can spot something wrong a mile off, right? Oh, it's so easy. <laughs> yeah. But when somebody does something right or good, you know, we we really have to remind ourselves to go, oh, I need to comment on that or I need to acknowledge that because it for, it doesn't come naturally. The other stuff does, which is an unfortunate part of human nature. Yeah, you know, it's like one people, one person can screw up one thing. And what do you think about all day long or go home to dinner and talk to your spouse about that one thing that one person did? But what if we could change the conversation? And that's got to start within our own head first. So I encourage people to look at, we talked about the pendulum when we first started this mm -hmm. interview, look at the pendulum, look at the scale. And are you making as a big, as big of a deal out of the things that people are doing right as they are doing them wrong? We should even be making a bigger deal out of those things. But if somebody is like, oh my goodness, they came in on time, they were ready to go and they were prepared. Does that thought sit in our head all day long going, wow, I've got a great employee and then you go home and share that with your spouse and saying, man, I got to tell you about John, you know, he just came to work and he brought it and he was ready to go and brought cookies for the team, whatever it might be, you know, we don't rave about those things. And if we did, we could totally transform our culture. Uh, and not just, culture. yeah, and not just in the workplace either. Uh, Families. Because well, for just the world in general, we've become yes. um, so hung up on, uh, as a guest of mine some time back termed as recreational anger, <laughs> is where people, it's their hobby now, you know, get being angry about everything and pontificating and firing off oh, stuff. Yeah. So I'm, we I'm need to get it. Yeah, so go, go ahead. ahead. I, was gonna well, say I just said we need to get away from that. Yeah, I'm part of one Facebook group and I'll re, uh, catch an occasional post and they're posting pictures of people who park crooked in the parking lots. Like, how could this person possibly do that? Look at the way they parked. I'm like, 
you don't know the way the person was parked that was next to them when they originally, you, you don't know, you're making a lot of assumptions in the situation. <laughs> the same thing is true in the workplace is that we're making a lot of assumptions when we focus on the negative, but why not give people the benefit of the doubt and say, wow, you know what? I know that you would want to do this right. So let's have a conversation about it. And the other part is that you touched on earlier that I wanted to come back to is, uh, Typically, and and I've grown up in corporate America too. And um, typically, throughout my career, is you know, you you either had to do or you have performance appraisals, right? Those are awful things. And <laughs> and what and what are the, and what are they usual? Like your performance appraisals are usually okay, Julie. Here's something that you you did pretty well this year, and, and well done on that. Now I'm going to switch over to the 55 things that you need to improve on, right? And we focus on that. Instead of going, hold on a second, why aren't we focusing on Julie's strengths? Why aren't we make, giving her more of what she's really good at, rather than trying to remediate things that maybe Julie's never going to be good at, or never, or, you know, this is not her, her thing, but we focus so much on oh, we need to fix this bit over here instead of saying, no, we need to get rid of that bit and we need to focus on where she really makes an impact. Exactly. And I think a lot of leaders are missing out on the opportunity to set objectives with each employee so that each employee, when they're working for you, knows what is it that I need to be doing so that I can be considered a success in my position. And it starts right from when you hire with laying out those objectives. And then I really recommend everybody having regular one-on-one -on -one meetings monthly, you know, if that can be done, but you meet with them monthly to track and measure progress against those objectives. And then the year-end evaluation is just a summary. It's just a fun summary that's put together based upon all of your monthly conversations. And it should come together easily if you're doing it right. But most people are like, all right, now I got to review a whole year in my head. What did I like? What didn't I like? Where did this person tick me off? Um, you know, and then we're trying to put it into paper format and becomes a tooth pulling kind of mm. process. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I've always been under the belief that you just, you do appraisals as you go day yeah. in day out you know that, that you don't really need this i understand why they do them but i i never really subscribe to it uh here's another that thing that philosophy, just, yeah 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 here's another thing that i just wanted to um touch on as well is so one of the things that it was started before the pandemic but it's definitely been accelerated by the pandemic is new ways of working and organizing your organization whether it's um, you know, not going back to physical offices or some people going back, some people being virtual, being a hybrid of both. Uh, so there's a lot of changes have happened to how companies are actually structured. And I don't think a lot of leaders have caught up with that in the way of, OK, how do I how do I need to evolve the culture in order to make this work? And also, how do I evolve to make our organization more flexible so that we can accommodate these types of things? Because at the end of the day, if you were, if you can accommodate people working in different ways, non-traditional ways or whatever, but they're being effective and that and they're happier, why wouldn't you do that? Exactly. And I think I was lucky when I was working for Michelle in corporate America, she was a real pioneer for working at home. And she actually set me up so that I could work at home too, which was a little bit of spoilage for a while, because then when I worked for the next boss, it changed. <laughs> but I was able to work at home two or three days a week, understanding what the objectives were, set me up with a computer. But you have to understand that even though people are working at home, the communication still has to be there. Yep. And right now, just like we're doing here on Zoom, it's easy just to hop on Zoom and have the same kind of communication that you would have in person or to meet for coffee or to get together for a team lunch, whatever it might be. But you don't, even if people are working remotely, you don't drop the communication. You improve it and still look to make it better and more effective. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's the key part and being flexible in your thinking around how an organization can be structured and take advantage of all of all the developments out there. Because I mean, I'm a big believer. I'm a ref I, I always call myself the reformed smoker of um, of remote working or virtual working, because when I ran some companies, I hated it, couldn't stand people not being in the office, oh. <laughs> never believed. And and then I evolved, obviously. And you know, we run a largely virtual organization today. And to be honest, I feel in some ways that I've developed better relationships with people 
virtually than I often did when they were sitting, you know, across, you know, a few desks away from me. So um, I think that's a bit of a fallacy that you can't do. You can't create culture. Of course you can. Of course you can. And I think the focus has to be on quality, not quantity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times our workplaces become destructive because we're thinking in terms of quantity. How many times a day can I say hello to John? How many times a day can I do this? (laughs) You, you don't need to. And a lot of times it's a distraction. So focus on quantity that really would make an impact on how an employee feels, you know, about their job, about you as a supervisor, about their coworkers. So there's still all that that um, you've got to bring to life, but it's quant- it's quality, not quantity. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's and, and I think you have to have conversations with people nowadays and understand their circumstances uh, and not make assumptions about it because you mentioned about the assumptions earlier about the crooked car parked and I think yeah I think assumptions is something we all fall into but you know at the end of the day you don't really know the setup of the virtual person unless you actually ask them say and how, how does it work like are there kids there do you need this time blocked off in the morning and you can work more at this time or however however it, it, it works but you have to have that conversation actually find out Absolutely. You know, and talk about, well, what's going to get in your way of achieving these objectives? What do you see as your obstacles? What do you see as the things you're going to struggle with so that we could set you up for success, whether that means providing you a coach that you can consult with or during one of our team meetings, we could all brainstorm on how we're all handling this situation. You know, when you're on a Zoom meeting and the doorbell rings, what do you do? (laughs) You know, or different things that might come up. Um, But yeah, I think the, the conversation, critically important. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, as we as we come towards the close here, uh, Julie, what is what is one piece of advice that you would give to people maybe going into 2022 if they wanted to make if they just wanted to make one single focus to change and help to improve their culture? Where would you say that focus should be? I would say really start looking at the things that you're doing where you're not seeing a result And workplace detox is about removing the toxins from your workplace. It's about moving the thing, removing the things that you're doing that aren't effective. And there was one organization I was consulting with and they really wanted an employee newsletter and they were trying to get the different departments to submit in articles. And they had like 20 different efforts in place to remind those people to get the articles in, to do this, to do that. It's like they were just running this huge circle to get everybody to meet this objective. And then it's like, well, how important is that newsletter? How important is that everybody contributes? So really look at the objectives of what you need to be doing as a leader to be successful and then think about the objectives you need your people to be accomplishing and then ask yourself what do we need to stop doing as an organization that's costing us a lot of time a lot of money but not contributing to the results yeah and that i i I love that piece of advice because i i think that's where so many people fall down it's like when you have a, a planning session so you so you have your yearly planning so maybe you have a planning session for for what we're going to do next year and people are firing off ideas where we could do this and we could do this and we could do this. And then you say, okay, that, that's great, fantastic ideas. What do we stop doing? And crickets, right? It's like we have, we really struggle with the stop doing piece um, yeah. because we've invested so much in it or we're attached or, or, you know, I don't know what it is, but psychologically, it's really hard for us to let go. And I, I agree with you. I think that's an incredibly important exercise. And I think it's time to simplify and to really figure out what are the main things that we need to be doing to be effective and to drop the other things and to put a value on freedom, to put a value on having a good work-life balance. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, bring that energy to energy to work. Hey, listen, Julie, this has been fantastic. All of Julie's information is going to be below the video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. Sure. So you can uh, visit me, Julie Bartkus, and that's J-U-L-I-E-B-A-R-T as in Tom, K-U-S. And uh, there's a place where you can sign up for a free session with me. But if you would like help in just laying out some initial steps for transforming your workplace culture, uh, please feel free to get in touch if you resonate with this message in this interview. And I'd love to help you out Um, because a lot of organizations are struggling, not knowing, well, how do we turn this around? How do we create a more positive culture? And right now, now, John, you know, one of the biggest uh, struggles is attracting staff, attracting the right staff. And that's something that I'm incredibly passionate about and that I'd love to help you get a game plan in place for. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, listen, you know, we 
work is hard enough as it is, uh, you know, and then the world we live in today is hard enough as it is, you know, we don't, you don't need to be miserable in the thing that you do for many hours every day. So I would, I would encourage people to check out, check out Julie and check out what she does and good. Hey, start 2022. Why don't you start it with a detox program? That'd be beautiful. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, listen, thanks, Julie. My name is John Thank Golden. You. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Yeah.